It's wonderful to be here at BYU. I've spent a few years here in the past, both as a student and as a teacher. But it's especially an honor today to be with you and to introduce my very dear friend, the Honorable Ambassador Bold of Mongolia. Before I tell you about him, I would like to introduce his wife, Ayung. She's here with him today, and we do welcome at least one Mongolian, maybe two Mongolian students here. There are a number here on the campus. Ambassador Bold has a very international and impressive education. He studied first at the Military Institute in Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, and then at the Military Diplomatic School in Moscow, and then at the Naval Postgraduate School here in the United States. Since finishing his education, he worked with the Ministry of Defense in Mongolia from 1977 to 1984, then was with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then was ambassador to Japan from 1985 to 1989. Back to Mongolia with the Ministry of Defense, two years, and then was secretary and director of the Institute of Strategic Studies in Mongolia. He served then as the Deputy Director of the General Intelligence Ed Agency of Mongolia, then advisor to the Great Hural, which is the Parliament in Mongolia, and advisor to the President, also Executive Secretary of the National Security Council of Mongolia, and now as the Ambassador from Mongolia to the United States. Very pleased to introduce my dear friend, the Honorable Ambassador of Mongolia, Mr. Bold. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for your kind introduction. Just one correction. Uh, I was not ambassador to Japan. Uh, yes, uh, yes, the embassy, of my golden embassy in Japan. I'm also happy to be here with you and uh, exciting my visit to the state of Utah because the first time I'm coming to this uh, state uh, but uh, I was the second time to this university. And the last January, and we've been to the university, the Brigham Young University in Hawaii, and we impressed very much uh, by our visit there. So this time, I, just, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the country which we called uh, Mongolia. Uh, probably you know well about the geography, if you look at this map. Uh, my name is the B-O-L-D, Bold, as the Dr. Jackson said. Uh, I always start my uh, talk with the uh, promotion of my name, because Bold is very the popular name in the Mongolia. Almost uh, one-fifth of men in this country has such name, Bold. And uh, like the Chinese Li, and the Japanese Kato, and the Korean the Kim, also, same meaning like in the English, strong, still, bold. Uh, so we need some a little bit of study. Why they have the same meaning? Who borrow from whom this word? And first of all, also I would like to thank the, the Brigham Young University for organizing this meeting. It's a wonderful opportunity for me because I had a lot of the, about this university even the before come to United States as ambassador because the reputation of the university among the young Mongolians are very high and many parents highlighted the, of this university. Also the Mongolian government knows well what the prominent contribution made and made by this university to Mongolia's education development in the last about a decade. When I visited the, this university camp in the Hawaii, I found that the more than 50 students from Mongolia and surprised very much uh, how and when we uh, have such a large number of students there. So, as you look at this map, you know, the is sandwiched uh, between the two big giants. 
When we talk uh, to the American people, friends, colleagues, uh, we always talk about what the similarities and the differences between us and between the countries. Of course, if we count the differences between us, we can do it. A lot of uh, we can find a lot of differences, uh, starting from the geographical distance uh, and the size of population and degree of power. But also we have the sim similarities. Bangalore just sandwiched uh, between two big giants. One is the former superpower, another one is uh, the rising power. But we are the small nation, very, very small. <coughs> When the Mongol Empire was uh, uh, disintegrated in the 14th century, uh, Mongolia had been divided into many parts forever. And today uh, you can find the remains of the Mongolian soldiers everywhere on the Sea of Japan, uh, in the, the Krakow Church uh, in the Poland, uh, in the uh, mountain villages in the Afghanistan and outside of Baghdad and Basra, even in the mountains of the former Yugoslavia. And yes, and we're proud of our history and ancestors. For us, they were not the barbarians, as some describe them, uh, because it was time the Mongol Empire that promoted three basic things. First one is the freedom of religious. Second one is free trade system, which is now trying to do <laughs> American government. And last one is uh, the Mongolians uh, promoted interaction among the civilizations. Who don't agree with this policy, uh, fast uh, go away. So since this collapse of empire uh, to preserve our own identity and not to be assimilated into the two big civilizations which surround us, were the most priority for the small nation, even today, for many centuries. And last century, 20th century, had been the century of the struggle for the liberty, survival, and independence of Mongolia. During the last century, that we declared our independence twice. But each time, this decision had been decided by our neighboring countries, unfortunately. Mongolia proclaimed itself as the republic and approved its uh, first constitution in 1924. And Mongolia is a country with 100, uh, 100 uh, of years of the proud tradition and the statehood of history. And next year, 2006, uh, the we are going to celebrate 800 years of the establishment of the Mongolian statehood by the Genghis Khan. And today, Mongolia is the republic uh, with parliamentary government and with the directly elected president. The Mongolia's new constitution, which we approved in uh, 1992, stipulates that there should be the democratic and the civic and humanitarian society in Mongolia. And Mongolia is small in population, but still homogeneous country, and large in territory and rich in minor resources. The homogeneous is still a very important part of the identity. Even though we have the special law which regulate number of the immigrants foreigners in the country. According to this law, number of immigrants in Mongolia, no, actually we don't have immigrants, number of the permanent uh, living, uh, the foreigners in the country should not exceed 1% of the whole population. We have just a two and a half million population. It means those people should not exceed 25,000. And today, the Mongolia, they managed to build up the multi-party system. 
and we have the more than 20 political parties, if you compare it with this small population, it's too large number. And we held, uh, since 1990, the nine free and fair elections already. In less than two weeks, uh, the Mongolia will have the fourth the presidential election as well. And four political parties are running for this presidential seat. And we have also very influential the civil society and the NGOs in the country. The number of the NGOs in the Mongolia even exceed those in the PRC to China. And according to the Freedom House, the Mongolia is totally free country since the 1994. And nine, in last year, in uh, 2004, the Mongolia's GDP growth was very highest since we shipped to the market economy, 10 and 6 percent. And previous year, the also economic growth was satisfactory around 5 and 6 percent. The main factors are the mining industry. And I see the many of the mining surrounding the Salt Lake. So I just uh, my first thinking is, uh, oh, there are a lot of opportunities between the Utah and Mongolia, particularly in this mining sector, copper, gold, flourish, and random. So day after tomorrow, when I go on to see the governor, I would like to raise this issue. We have the opportunity. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. So the, the state logos of Mongolia, the state symbol, uh, state flag, the blue color symbolize, as you know, the blue sky because uh, around the 250 days in Mongolia, all was blue. The red color symbolizes, don't think, revolution. It symbolizes uh, the loyalty and prosperity according to Mongolian tradition, not revolution. So this uh, quick uh, look at land of Mongolia. Look at the pictures, uh, looks like uh, surround the mountains, it seems to me. The people, <coughs> we have very high literacy and uh, Regarding the religion, yeah, still the, most of people follow the Buddhism. According to the latest uh, poll, the more than 70 percent of the population still the follow Buddhism. And also according to the latest poll, around the 15 percent is the wrong number. Around the 15 percent of the population follow the non-traditional religion. Population growth is uh, declining, and 10 years ago we had the 3% the annual growth, but now it's declined. So ethnic structure of Mongols. This red color shows the Russian area where the Mongols people live there still. The Buryat and the Tova republics, which are bounded with Mongolia, where we have the, around 1 million Mongols still. In the West, uh, there is the small the Autonomic Republic in the Russia where Mongols settled. This uh, red color shows where the region of the China where the Mongols settled. And we have around the three and a half million Mongols in the China. It's no more the Mongolian uh, citizens. They belong to the PRC. And altogether around the world, we have around the six million Mongols, only two and a half million in my country. So, quick look at the economy. Still, we have the very long number of tourists who visit to Mongolia, including Americans. Last year, we have only 15,000 Americans who visited Mongolia. Still not good enough, very low number. Even though we made the decision to exempt all Americans from the visa fee, but Still, the law is very, uh, number is very low. So, quick look at the modern history of Mongolia. I uh, mentioned in 1911, the Mongolia declared its uh, first independence. 
It was the Manchur name pen was collapsed. One the difference between us, I mean the between us, between the Mongolian and Chinese scholars regarding the 1911, it was time Manchur name pen was collapsed and both of us, China and Mongolia declared their independences. Okay, so it's the Mongolia's external environment. Uh, the prior we moved to the democracy and market economy until the 1990. So at the time we had vision, the world consists of only two big giants, former Soviet Union and PRC. The bear is very big. At the time, you know, the dragon is a little bit small at the time. Why the wolf? And we are, they say the Mongolian originated from the wolf, according to legendary. There is such saying, the wolf uh, was killed by the person with uh, divine descent. And wolf is seen by the person with same descent, but wolf is not seen by the underlings. So if you're not seeing the wolf, you should think, to see them, to get some fortune. So the, with the time, we had a lie relationship with the former Soviet Union. It's why that we hide behind the big bear from the Dagon. So it was time the only country which uh, we had uh, very close relations in Northeast Asia was the North Korea. So Mongolia was the one of the favorite places uh, Visit by the Kim Il Sung, late Kim Il Sung. He always, you know, they used the railway, not plane. <clears throat> in the early 1990s, there was the big debate in Mongolia after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the which uh, region, which region we should uh, choose in order to belong to. Central Asia or Northeast Asia, because you know at the time Soviet Union was disintegrated, it went away, so no, no more the alliance relationship. Then the PRC still the uh, very hostile relations, which continued for the last three decades, and then at the time 1990, 1989, the crackdown of democracy in the Tiananmen Square, so the we had no choice to go to to the north and to the south. So we are seeking the new way in the international arena. So there was the debate, uh, Mongolia should belong to Central Asia or Northeast Asia. But after the three years debate, we choose the Northeast Asia. So today the foreign direct investment has helped in the industry in Mongolia to continue to expand. And ecotourism is also flourishing in the country. In addition, the natural, the pasture-dependent livestock is still is a very important sector of the economy in the country. And Mongolia is still the second largest producer of Kashmir in the world after the China. And Mongolia and PRC very hard competitor in the world market by the Kashmir also, we have uh, still the number of competitive advantages for attracting foreign investors like stable political environment and easy access to the market in the Russia and the China and extensive natural resources and vast territory with clean uh, and undisturbed natural surroundings and relatively young and educated population and attractive tax system. If you look at the population structure, still the 50% of the population is under age of 35. And around 70% of the population is still under age of 16, very young population. Even the president, former uh, president, prime minister, leadership, very young. 
when the foreigners visit and met with our leadership, they're surprised how you manage this country. <coughs> also, among others, as mentioned, even though the length longer country, but uh, we have very limited infrastructural access to the rest of the world. So therefore, we want to join the world economy by placing high priority on the production on the large capacity of major mining projects uh, development, as I mentioned. Also establishing some of the competitive chemical industry and increasing productivity in the agricultural sector. For instance, we have very quality uh, the lamb and beef in Mongolia we produce. When we, when we look at the Russian Far East, they always bring the lamb and beef from where? From New Zealand and Australia. And we're surprised, and we always try to talk to Moscow. You can meet, you can buy the our very cheap, very quality meats. Why are you doing this one? But you know that it's very hard to talk to Russians. <laughs> they enjoy very much with the meat from the New Zealand and Australia. They spend a lot of. So it's very uh, understandable. So still though we're in the economic sector, so we are focused on improving this international competitiveness uh, of our copper and Kashmir products and accelerating the development of mining, and infrastructure, and tourism. So you can find this on the, our placement in the Northeast Asia. Also, meanwhile, the Mongolia's this narrow economic base uh, makes the economy highly vulnerable to the weather. It's why the weather is very important condition for the livestock in Mongolia. In the last two years, we have very mild, nice winters, which uh, created very favorable condition for the growing of the livestock. But in previous uh, uh, three years, we had very harsh winters. It's why we lost uh, around the one third of our uh, livestock. We have around 29 million livestock at the time. We lost almost 9 million at the time. Also, the private uh, sector is very important in Mongolia's economy. The 80% of the GDP belongs to the private sector. If you compare it, this figure with Russian and Chinese, the, our figure is totally different. So Mongolian economy is now totally, mostly the, dependent on the private sector. So a little bit about some Mongolian foreign policy. Uh, the WPS were the independent, non-aligned, and multi-pillared open foreign policy. Too much open foreign policy, as we say. And we are gaining more and more friends from the outside world. We are gaining more and partners from the outside world. And we advance now, advance our position uh, regionally and internationally. The foreign policy priority of Mongolia is just to develop long-term, stable, and friendly and good neighborly relations with its two neighbors, with PRC in China. So one of similarities between the United States and Mongolia is you have the naturally, geographically, two neighbors. Your relations with Canada and Mexico are very important, of course, and our relations with China and Russia are the same. If you do something wrong regarding the, your relations with China and Russia, next morning you will get more higher fee for your transportation, your goods, to outside market. Uh, we export a lot of textile to the US markets. So it's very important, our relations with China, therefore very vulnerable. Also, meanwhile, we, we're trying to maintain the, some kind of the balanced relationship with both the China and Russia. So you can see the, how we're trying to diversify and balance our relationship between our neighbors. Before the 1990, uh, almost more than 90% of Mongolia's trade went to the former Soviet Union, totally dependent on them. But now you can see that uh, now it's around 50% of Mongolia's trade goes to the both the Russia and China. So, so we did this one. We tried to diversify our source of foreign trade. The rest of the foreign trade goes to the outside world. Because this, our relations with both the China and Russia were always the matter of die for survival for Mongolia. When two neighbors uh, 
the rival to each other. The choices available to Mongolia in international relations were limited, and Mongolia needed to lean to one of them. It's the very limited choice. This policy always left another one in apprehension. But today, the such a rivalry relations between them is over, and we hope almost forever, we hope still. So thereby, Mongols, uh, we are maintains the balanced relationship with both of them, Russia and China. So now they are the, our main partners, main trade partners, main investors to Mongolia. But on a wide uh, range of uh, political, historical, and strategic issues, Mongolia has worked with uh, both our neighbors, uh, always, with, always with open big eyes still. We need this. Still we maintain very close friendly relations with both Koreas in the Northeast Asia. Mongolia is only one of the few countries still maintaining such friendly relations with both Koreas. Look at North Korea. I always talk to the American friends about North Korea because it's a very nice country, <laughs> friendly country for us. During the Korean War, we tried to assist in our best uh, to the Korean people. We sent a lot of food there. After Korean War, we brought a lot of the North Korean orphan children to Mongolia. Even nowadays, and many parents in Mongolia send their kids to the North Korea to take some summer rest there because they have very nice beach there. We don't have any access to sea. So many kids go to the North Korea, take rest, and they swim in the ocean. For the first time in their life, they see the beach and ocean, sea. They come back with happy. Japan is our largest donor country in Mongolia. The Japan still send in the largest number of tourists to Mongolia. But in last year, when I take my vacation and back to my home, are surprised by the large number of tourists from the Germany in France, not from the United States. The capital streets full with uh, tourists from the France and Germany. So where is Americans? I ask it. And then I back, I ask the American colleagues, why you not take a vacation, go to Mongolia? They complain to me. Because the Europeans, they have the longer vacation than the we are. It's why they had more time to visit other places. It's why they are, <laughs> with the, this policy, for instance, Mongolian aviation, we operate uh, both the Airbus and Boeing to hard competitors. The Boeing company always telling us, oh, Ambassador, why you should just sell the Airbus to us, to Boeing company, and we will give you the another one. You don't need to maintain such uh, two the competition the airplanes because it's very expensive but it's the it, but to maintain the airbus to operate the airbus in mongolia as you know the symbol of relations between the europe and mongolia also it's very useful to to have the two competitors in the mongolia So now a little bit about the bilateral relationship between uh, Mongolia and the U.S. So it's uh, nice pictures. Uh, they show the uh, different parts uh, of the Mongolia. If you go to the west of Mongolia, you can find uh, such high mountains. If you go to the north, you can find the very fresh lakes there. If you go to the south, you can find this famous the Gobi Desert there. East of the country is the just a step, endless step. Some the area. This is famous uh, uh, dear stones. Also, we call sometimes some of the Turkish uh, stones because the Turkish people uh, consider. The birthland of the Turkish people is Mongolia. 
this, uh, this shows the linkage between the Mangal and Turkish people too. Okay, I mentioned about this one and so now is the environment where we are. You look this uh, bear became a little bit smaller than before. Uh, look at the dragon became stronger and larger. Particularly, the stomach becomes larger, and uh, uh, we are between them. But now we have more neighbors than before. Look at the east. There is the Central Asia, Republic Center, Central Asia, the remotest Islam countries. The Korea, above Korea, there. Uh, this uh, red and blue uh, fishes symbolizes, you know, the Korean symbol. The Japan is still there. And we always, when we talk about uh, Northeast Asia, we always include the Canada, which is, uh, we have some different view from the American colleagues, because Canada is very important for us, you, for you too. So Canada should be there, and Sam is still there. So it's a totally different environment. Uh, which we had uh, uh, in uh, 1990, which I showed you before. So still our headache is relationship between the China and Russia. Is there any guarantee that relationship between them will not be deteriorated in the future? In last century, the relationship between them went down and up four times. Each time, we should have the different environment. So it's very limited choice in international arena for us. We always talk about North Pacific. When we go to the United States, talk to our partners, and colleagues there, we use this definition, Northeast Asia. When we go to Canada, we always use this definition because Canadians like this definition. So it's a little bit about the bilateral relations between Mongolia and the United States. As young relations, we established uh, diplomatic relations in 1987. But indeed, uh, the prior it, uh, we had a number of negotiations to establish official relations between us. The last one was in the early 1960s. But at the time, the United States engaged in Vietnam, and we withdraw from the negotiations, saying, uh, you are too imperialistic country. You are going to invite Vietnam. So we stopped our negotiations. Of course, it was different policy at the time. But uh, I, al I always talking about some consequences of this. It was time that many American, young Americans, number of Americans, they trained to be specialists on the Mongolia in the early 1960s. They were sent to the University of Leeds in the England, uh, Great Britain, where there was a very nice Mongolian faculty there. They learned Mongolian language, Mongolian study took. But then they left out without job because of our decision. But uh, now we found uh, all of them, they became very prominent U.S. ambassadors to the different countries, to the China, uh, Thailand, Israel, very important countries. But still they keep uh, this memory, how they learned the uh, Mongolian study, Mongolian language, and took the Mongolian study, still there. So new area of political relations uh, we considered to start in the last year when the, our president uh, visited the uh, United States and we issued for the first time the very good political statement which we declared for the first time the comprehensive partnership. According to this statement, for the first time the United States acknowledged Mongolia as the same democratic country as the United States. For the first time the United States acknowledged, according to the statement, we shared the common values. For the first time the United States acknowledged we have the common strategic interests, and then we declared the comprehensive partnership. Comprehensive partnership, for the first time, the United States used this definition in the bilateral relations with other countries. 
comprehensive partnership includes everything, political partnership, strategic partnership, education partnership, cultural partnership, economic partnership. Why we choose this definition? First, we would like to use the definition strategic partnership, but later we changed this one, we can choose this comprehensive partnership. Still, still, when I talk to American colleagues, they always ask me, what's your relationship with Russia and China? And my answer is always, don't scare of them. <laughs> because if you have very good relationship with Russia and China, then we could have very good relationship with Mongolia. In early 1990s, uh, some of the policymakers in the Washington DC had such thinking. First, you should improve your relations with Russia, China, then we could think something. Uh, probably a time comes, it's why that we have such uh, very good uh, political statement. But also we understand it's very vulnerable for Americans uh, to have too close relationship with Mongolia between the two big giants, which is also very important for the United States. So some opportunities uh, in the bilateral relations between us. You can find uh, some highlights made by the policymakers. Last year, the former Secretary of State, uh, Colin Powell, made a very good highlight of Mongolia. He said, Mongolia is the one of the seven democracies in the East Asia in Pacific. Mongolia is the one of the eight allies and friends in this area. So be very proud uh, by this highlight. As I said, uh, if we count many differences between us, we can find many of them. But we have those some similarities. For instance, geographically, the both of us uh, have only two neighbors. And therefore, naturally, uh, we would like to be the third neighbors to each other. If not in terms of geography, but in terms of the friendship, partnership, and cooperation. It's very important. Also, the both of us are renowned for their skills, as you know, as horsemen. Horses in the frontier were formative elements uh, in uh, uh, helped shape our, you know, American Mongolian uh, national characters. So, by expanding the bilateral, bilateral relationship, uh, we discovered the more similarities between us. We share no common uh, boundary, but we share the money, the common values. For instance, last year, the first time the Mongolian Caucus Group was established in the US Congress. And so far, the many of the congressmen joined already to this caucus, and many of them expressed to join this caucus. And last year, the Mongolian made the decision to make the English as the second official language in the country. And uh, we've taken the all necessary measures uh, to do the English as the second official language. Before the Russian was the compulsory study in the education system, uh, before the 1990, but the English uh, replaced the Russian as the compulsory study since the 1990, and we are the last uh, generation who speak the Russian, and nowadays even they face the shortage of the Russian expert. It's not a good thing. So we made the English, not the Russian and Chinese, as, the, uh, as our second official language. Of course, this decision has the, some political, educational, and other backgrounds. But all of the information we get from the outside world is English, so it's the, just related to the educational and the economic business opportunities. And Today is the biggest challenge faced by Mongolia is still in the internal front. You know that domestic politics is always interesting in everywhere, and not exception in Mongolia. And indeed, uh, there are a lot of jobs in Mongolia to be done to consolidate democracy. But democracy is on the right track in Mongolia. If you compare it to the Central Asian Republics, Mongolia is totally different. Democracy works well in Mongolia. 
also in turn, we are talking to disintegration publics. Look at us. You can take some example from us. Uh, even we talked before to the president of Kayu. Uh, look at us. But they lost time. It took time. And uh, we are not Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, because democracy in Mongolia is our own product. Uh, therefore, there is no need any colors of revolution there in Mongolia. And, but we understand any freedom should be followed by the responsibility, responsibilities. So despite some of the encouraging statistics of Mongolia's economy in the last uh, three years, the life is still not easy in Mongolia. The ordinary people ask more often uh, what benefit they bring by the democracy to the daily life of the people in the street. So to find the acceptable question to this, uh, to find acceptable answer to this question is not easy, of course, for the local politicians in Mongolia. But this is a high priority for the government. The poverty is not declining. And the gap between rich and the poverty is widening. It's why the other people ask, when the country is rich in the mineral deposits, when we have the such large number of livestock, when we have small population, why you cannot manage the small economy and to improve the life there? So it's the natural question raised by the people there. So it's the main priority of the government uh, and people in the country how to solve these issues, how to decline, reduce the poverty. So it's why the Mongolia put much hope uh, on the fact that the, uh, it was selected uh, uh, among, the one of, among the one of the 17 countries uh, mm -hmm. by the U.S. government in last year as the part of the Millennium Challenge Count. As you know, the Millennium Challenge Count is the new kind of Marshall Plan announced by the President Bush in 2001. This administration, the past was the new policy uh, regarding the developing countries uh, taking the uh, new policy on the development aid regarding the developing countries. So they uh, put the criteria to choose the countries which will be uh, qualified to receive this aid. And they put uh, to find 16 criteria, and Mongolia met 15 of them. So they choose first the 16 countries. Mongolia was among them. Only Mongolia met 15 the criteria of the 16. And other countries met uh, just uh, 10 and 9 criteria. So last year and uh, recently we submitted our proposal to administration to get this aid uh, with the amount of 252 million US dollars on education, including how to make this English second official language, on the health care and on the infrastructure and on the how to improve the business environment in Mongolia. So still we are negotiating with administration to get this uh, grant aid. So finally, some challenges. Of course, the long geographical distance still. Still the Russia and China is very important for the United States, the fate neighbor. So lastly, the highlight made by the President Theodore Roosevelt many years ago. I'm surprised by the first President of the United States who ever visited Mongolia is the President Hoover. When he was the young, the mine and the engineer, he visited Mongolia in the late uh, 19th century and met with Mongolian, the head of Mongolian Buddha at the time, and he asked to pray for him because he said it with time. I'm going to run for the president, so I need uh, some the support from the Buddha, so please pray for me. 
<laughs> but uh, later he did this one, you know. <coughs> so it's very wonderful opportunity to share my views uh, with you. And I, once again, I would like to express my highest appreciation to the Dr. Jackson, the Mangada's Honorary Council to the state of Utah. As you, as he mentioned, he visited Mangala 16 times. It's a large number. Thank you. And uh, I found also the many similarities between Mangala and the state of Utah. I just arrived yesterday evening. Even though when I, I arrived at the airport, I just smelled the air. Very similar to Mangala, very fresh, very nice. And then this uh, top of hills, mountains, looks like uh, ours. And horses, of course. I had, but you have a lot of horses there. And, but I feel the most similar thing there is the sense of the hospitality. You are very, very nice people there. No arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much once again. Thank you. So if you have questions, so I will try to answer. And no questions, more better. <laughs> okay. Um, it seems like Mongolia went through quite a change in foreign trade between 1989 to 2004 between Russia and China. It seems like it went through a dram dramatic change of its ratio. Like, for example, Russia was 90% and 2004 was 22%. So what kind of, what kind of policies did, you, did Mongolia implement to diversify its trade? Yes, the former Soviet Union was the main trade partner of the Mongolia. But when the Soviet Union disintegrated, the, all of the relationship with the former Soviet Union were collapsed. As you know, the, not only Mongolia, but the relationship of other countries with the former Soviet Union also collapsed too. And there was the one issue between us, this big debt issue. Because the Russia uh, heritated from the Soviet Union, and when we started our new relationship with new Russia, there was the big issue, the big debt issue. So the tilt to solve this issue, uh, we decided uh, not to take strong measures to develop our relations with Russia. And we demanded from Russia to apologize for some of the bad things which uh, done by the former Soviet Union regarding Mongolia. Uh, almost same thing, which is now demanded by the Baltic states uh, from the Russia. But uh, we are neighbors, uh, so the relation is too important because the whole economy depends on the Russian supply. Therefore, it was also very hard for us to wait uh, to solve this issue so we waited longer no, for a few years to solve this back debt issue. So it's the main reason why this bilateral trade and economic cooperation was declined. And then also we spent some time to find the new rooms of the cooperation between us. So at the time we focused mostly on the Russian Far East because it's our neighbors, and uh, we should uh, explore some new opportunities in the Russian Far East, and the trade and the economic fields. Then we solved this big debt issue two years ago. 11 billion US dollars the Russian government demanded from us for the last decade. 
you should pay 11 billion US dollars. But how we pay for this debt once our Mongolia's GDP is only one point in the one and five billion, so almost uh, uh, four or five times. But uh, when the president put in the camps, the Russian president, his young man, he's very flexible man, he made decision to solve this issue. But again, he made decision recently. When we made decision to send our troops to Iraq, <laughs> Next month, the Russian government asked the Mongolia, we can renegotiate about the step issue. And we settled down this issue within just a few months because of our decision to join this coalition in the Iraq. Also, it's one of the reasons, yes. So it's not because of the uh, actual policy issue, but because of this legacy that our trade in the current regulations with uh, Russia declined, also helped us in such a way to maintain some balance. Yes.